Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian covering the Navy League Annual Sea Air Space uh, Conference and Exhibition here in National Harbor just outside Washington, D.C. Our coverage here is sponsored by Finn Cantieri, Huntington Ingalls, and Leonardo DRS. And we're honored to have with us as our first guest from this uh, event, the 39th Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Bill Moran. Sir, great seeing you. Thanks, Vago. Great to be here again. Uh, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, talking to you again. Um, let, let's start with... Uh, uh, the message you're trying to deliver here. You know, you've been talking about the importance of people, a larger fleet, uh, and also uh, agility, greater agility on the part of the Navy for a very long time. Um, I want to ask you a little bit more about the agility piece of it. The Navy's greatest strength historically has been its delegation of authority, its agility, and yet there are folks who look at the last couple of decades and say, look, risk, risk aversion has reached almost a cancerous level or a pernicious level within the, the, the force. Um, talk to us a little bit about changing that risk profile, getting that greater uh, authority and autonomy out of the force to, to get more minds sort of moving more quickly to a common goal. Yeah, you know, I, I don't see the risk aversion so much in the fleet, which is the premise a little bit of your question. But the risk aversion up here in headquarters is pretty high when it comes to programming, uh, buying stuff, requirements generation, and, and then how you deliver that to the fleet. Uh, so w I'm here to talk about how we up here in Washington need to take care of business so that the folks in the fleet get what they need to fight with. Um, and in the f when we give them the right material in the fleet uh, and they get to use it and experiment with it and operate it, and they'll teach us a lot more about the capability that those, uh, those pieces of equipment that we're delivering to them. So it's really about us being willing to take more risk up here so that we can deliver faster and, and uh, the fleet has the capability they need to fight in the near term. Do, and, but how are some of the specific ways um, you can do that and you and the senior Navy team? We saw Hondo Gertz, the Navy acquisition executive, just walk by. Uh, part of uh, his mantra also is to move things along uh, faster. What are some ways uh, you guys are working on doing that? Yeah, I mean, the principles are no different. You know, whether you're talking in the fleet as a commanding officer, you're talking in a senior executive in Washington, D.C. Hondo, uh, Secretary Gertz, talked a lot about uh, process over trust. And when you think about it, uh, our, our business up here is all about process, and it needs to change. Uh, he, used the, the term, um, he used the term of being able to disaggregate or delegate and then, and then differentiate, and then digital were his, three, his main themes. The, the disaggregate or uh, delegate is exactly what you're talking about in the fleet. Uh, if, we, if we want to move things faster, we have to be willing to delegate. So up here it's about delegating down to program managers and the fleet in order to make decisions about the stuff we're buying for them. Uh, unless we speed that process up, uh, we're going to be repeating this cycle every year. And I think that's his major theme today, this morning, was, hey, I'm not about process, I'm about people. I'm not about process, I'm about our Navy fleet and our people in the fleet. So the principles are the same. Let me uh, ask you about pacing threats. Russia and China, there are a lot of threats around the world, but Russia and China are paramount as great powers who are building up their capabilities, high, uh, highlighted in the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, but in fairness to you and the CNO, you guys have been talking about getting up on the war fighting step for some time. There are a lot of innovative efforts that are underway for, for leadership to draw good lessons from pockets, whether it's in the Navy, outside the Navy, the retired community, and recently there was a panel of retired folks up in uh, thinkers who are up in uh, Newport. Talk to us specifically about some of the capabilities that Russia and China are demonstrating increasingly that are going to drive the Navy to think differently about how it fights in the future and equips itself in the future. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of categories, uh, I'll avoid the specifics, but the categories for me clearly are range and speed. So they're building capabilities that can reach us at greater, greater range and faster than than we've been able to generate on our side. So we're going after that piece as fast as we can. Uh, so range, speed, and, and lethality of their, of their weapon systems. Uh, the other area that we're f heavily focused on and we see a potential for real, a real threat is a cyber threat. Um, it not only affects Wall Street and banks and, and communications uh, across our, our current uh, situation here in the U.S., but it all also affects our ability to fight. So we were heavily invested in, in getting after the cyber piece. And I guess the last one would be networks. Uh, 
part of building the range for our own capabilities is to make sure that we've got reliable and self-healing networks that, can, that will allow us to fight in any kind of situation in the future. Is it also more rangey weapons, weapons of greater range uh, and precision, uh, but also be able to deliver mass at range as well to uh, sort of turn the tables, particularly on China that's investing so much resources yeah. on, on those kind of capabilities? Yeah, ra range is, is, is key. So not only, not only the, the stuff we are going to fight with, the weapon systems, the, 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 the missiles and um, other energy kind of weapons have to be able to go at a longer range, but we've also got to be able to uh, disaggregate the fleet and be able to distribute that capability at greater range and stay networked and, and be able to continue to command and control that. So those those are the big challenges ahead of us as we extend the range. You may, may remember me talking about this uh, last year. I was trying to use a basketball analogy in March Madness, but you know the the game of basketball has changed because of the three point line. Greater range, it's moved to a guard game. It's not a center Bill Russell, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar game anymore. It's a Steph Curry game. It's a LeBron James game. We've got to move our own game out beyond that three-point line and be able to still win. And that, that's the effort we've got underway right now. You know, if this uh, Navy thing doesn't work out for you, sir, I mean, their basketball all commentary all is... is <laughs> you're I'm much more comfortable with that. <laughs> um, let, let me ask you, though, about the network challenge, right? Because uh, each one of our adversaries is looking as best they can to disrupt it. So as we're trying to move to better integrate and better connect, they're working to better disrupt anything that we can do, knowing that actually, you know, it's probably verifiable that decision-making skills have degraded because of cell phones and connectivity, uh, persistent connectivity. Talk to us a little bit about how are you going to be able to work and fight in an environment that could be completely denied at risk in space? Uh, you know, the, the Navy's as dependent as anybody, more dependent, as dependent as anybody is on space. Talk to us a little bit about that dynamic, how mentally, doctrinally, intellectually, folks have got to prepare themselves for a fight that may be very, very different than anything we've experienced in a long time. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple ways to get at that. One is war gaming, when this, when these sorts of uh, concepts uh, degrade because of uh, because of the issues you just described, we have to war game that and make sure we understand it intellectually and what what are the impacts on the way we fight? How do we make adjustments to that? How does that war gaming affect and influence what we buy in the future? Uh, and then the second part would be exercising it. So taking it to the fleet and exercising in degraded modes, and we're doing that routinely now in our strike group uh, preparations. So we're getting at it in both, both ways. The good news is we've done this before, and we know how to operate in this environment. We just haven't done it in a long time. So now we're building those reps and sets back in and creating some muscle memory in our warfighters at the front end. Um, uh, one of the uh, prime uh, warfighting uh, uh, homes is the Naval War College up in sunny uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, there was recently an interesting conference there, Breaking the Mold. Um, a lot of retired naval thinkers were, were in the room. You were there participating with it, as was the Navy under uh, Tom Modley. Um, talk to us, um, you know, the, your charge to them was, hey guys, you guys know what the threat is. You bring a lot of experience with you make some real bold, think out of the box in terms of what some recommendations would be for, for the future. Uh, and part of the idea, I'm told, is that that also gives top cover to folks that says, hey, look, you know, here are some pretty experienced people who think that we should take on some big issues. Talk to us more broadly about the, the broader process you have underfoot to draw all these lessons out from every pocket there exists. And then I want to also ask you how you translate that into reality, given that some of the ideas out there, especially regarding aircraft carriers, which is the centerpiece of the battle force, is the center for so much discussion that could potentially be very, very controversial. Yeah, a lot of packed into that question. Um, let's start with the Navy War College. And uh, that has been an institution since the 1800s that has really informed how we think about fighting in the future and developing plans and concepts of operations uh, through wargaming, through intellectual exchange of ideas. So this is nothing new for them, but what is new is the notion that we have a lot of people that, that uh, do a great job of articulating the problem. Uh, uh, not a lot of people that articulate potential solutions. And so we've asked these guys to get together, these big thinkers from outside the Navy, retired uh, professors that are skilled in the national security environment, uh, and I would just pause for a second and say one of the things I asked the group as I looked around the room at the debrief was, where's my active force? You know, we, we need active duty 
to participate in this at the junior officer level all the way up to the senior officer level. So we're going to do another one of these this fall. Um, this is going to continue on a regular drumbeat uh, to start to generate ideas that could change the trajectory of how we look at the Navy in the future. Um, we are all risk averse in this world at this level, at my level, of letting go of something that has been central to how we fight and willing to swing over to the other side and, and try something different until it's proven. Uh, the real challenge is do we have time to wait for both? Uh, so that's what we asked them to go look at. And uh, they came up with some very good ideas. They, they challenged a lot of our assumptions as we were thinking about the Navy of the future. And um, I think it, it, they demonstrated the value of this kind of dialogue, and we're going to do it routinely. CNO wants to continue this, um, and I'm, I know that the secretary and the under also want to continue it. Uh, so we're committed to having this dialogue go on for the next several years because you never know when that really good idea takes hold and uh, where that point comes where you can say, okay, this is really worth going after. Right now, I think we're just kind of letting it bubble up and bubbling up in a in an environment where everybody contributes uh, as opposed to the blogosphere, which, you know, it's hard to sift through um, sift through those ideas without having folks in the room having a face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, were there any particular ideas that you heard that you liked? Uh, I would say there are a lot of ideas that, that uh, have got my interest that I want to look at some more. Uh, and that's not a that's not a role here. It's it's uh, a, I believe, you know, when you're only up there for two hours, take a debrief. Uh, it's hard to really dive deeply into some of those ideas. But the ones you mentioned are always out there. People are always challenging the carrier. Um, and of course, that's how we've projected power for 70 years. How do we how do we think about changing the way we force project? in the environment we see developing around the globe. And those are important questions to ask. Um, you, uh, going back to that point, uh, the Naval War College, uh, it was the Naval War College that actually uh, demonstrated in its war games the importance and the validity of the carrier. It's just that the rest of the force wasn't that convinced. And then, you know, everybody thinks, oh, look, you know, in World War II, the aircraft carrier was in the forefront, and that was pioneered at the War College. It was pioneered at the War College. It wasn't embraced by the Navy until its battleships were shattered and everything was in new construction and the carriers were the only guys who could actually take the fight to the enemy. Um, if, if you decide that a major change is needed, does the leadership, do you think, have, will, will you be able to sell that? Because there is a lot vested in the way that we do things now. And let's just say that it is uh, the aircraft carrier shouldn't be at the center of it, or it should be a different aircraft carrier. That's a big muscle movement. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the tone, the time is right in order to be able to drive that kind of a tectonic change? Given, as you said, you're, you have to be ready for a lot of threats, but you may not. time may not be your ally on this. Well, the tectonic change is not evident to me yet. Uh, willing to listen to the, the debate. Uh, I know our leadership's willing to listen to the debate, but we're, I don't think we've seen anything that says this is a tectonic shift that is now upon us. Uh, but we, we clearly have to talk about it, debate it, and then decide whether there's another trajectory we want, we want to take. So, uh, I'm, I'm, like I said, the one that we're going to do this fall is a follow-on to the latest discussion. I think we'll narrow some of those down and, and expand on them as opposed to having lots of different ideas that uh, you can't get deep enough on. Do you, do, are you satisfied with the war fight, the war gaming rigor in the Navy now to actually test some of these ideas given that there is, there is debate about whether or not that skill set is as strong as it needs to be without criticizing anybody in particular? Yeah, no, I think we are starting to take off on the war gaming side again. You know, the Navy War College does eight or nine major war games every year that are at the strategic to operational level. Uh, and then we have at our Warfighting Development Center another half dozen to, or so that are at the tactical to operational level. And then you've got a bunch of think, towns around, think tanks around town uh, that also do wargaming to include the Center for Naval Analysis. They do a dozen or more every year. So there's a lot of gaming going on. Uh, and one of the things that has really captured my interest here is the role of AI in wargaming. Uh, and AI being able to turn uh, lessons learned inside the game f 
at a much higher pace, much faster. So you can do multiple iterations very quickly as opposed to taking hours, if not days, to find out what move resulted in what outcome. So uh, we're, we're looking very hard at how we inculcate AI into the wargaming process, which will uh, help us a great deal in, in terms of getting to potential solutions faster. Um, I want to bridge to potential solutions because I have a program question or two for you, but I want to start with uh, the tragic incidents last year. Um, Admiral Davidson made his uh, report, uh, Gary Ruffhead and Michael Baer, a former CNO and head of the Defense Business Board, made their recommendations. Uh, you and the under have been working on sort of the implementation phase of this. Uh, it's been greeted by a little bit of skepticism up on the hill where you spent some time to try to uh, talk to folks up there. Uh, from your perspective, why is the Navy on the right course in terms of the actions it's taking in the wake of those two deadly uh, incidents? Well, first, I believe that Admiral Davidson and his team got it about right in, this, in a comprehensive review. The Strategic Readiness Review stepped it up another level and had us look more broadly across the Navy, not just the surface community. Uh, and I take, we have taken all of those recommendations seriously. They don't all agree. They don't all match. And we've We've had to make those decisions at the highest level. So CNO and the secretary have uh, have refereed uh, which recommendations to go forward with and not go forward with. That said, the CR, which is the vast majority of the recommendations, are based on making the fleet safer and more effective to operate. I mean, that was critical that we get after that right away. So the 58 or so recommendations in the CR, we are well down the path of implementing, we're beginning to implement and program against them so that we have the resources behind it and it's not just a, it doesn't become a say-do mismatch for us. So uh, I, don't, I don't sense criticism or skepticism uh, so much from the Hill as much as how can we help? Where do, we, where do you need help to put this implementation plan together? They question some of the decisions we've made, and that's fair, that's what they're there for. And uh, we were just there last Friday and had a discussion with both the HASC and the SASC uh, uh, professional staff members. A lot of good questions, good dialogue. Uh, we, we have some push-ups to do to come back and, and explain further what we were doing. Uh, but I'm very confident in the implementation plan is getting after the right things. Um, do uh, you uh, were uh, the chief of naval personnel? Uh, you uh, lost a couple of inches in the process of, of being uh, hammered uh, in that. Uh, Navy has been in the talent management business for since 1775. If you really want to go back to it, um, what do you think are the core? Uh, things The under and I spoke a little bit about uh, the clean sheet review of looking at what naval education needs to be uh, for the future to grow as sort of a general, you know, more strategic thinkers. Um, talk to us a little bit about what your vision that you're bringing to this is, uh, you know, bearing in mind you were a chief of naval personnel, you bring that experience with you, but also looking at, you know, th this is an ever-changing uh, game uh, that you're trying to deal with. Yeah, I mean, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, I actually grew two inches in that job. I've shrunk since. <laughs> uh, it was it was the best job I've ever had by far. Uh, and, and you were a strapping 6'5 uh, when you started. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, what I learned in that job, talking to thousands of sailors, uh, is that what they want most out of life and service is some autonomy. Going back to your original question about being able to delegate. Uh, that autonomy comes with the ability to operate freely over the horizon the way we've done for 242 years. So that autonomy is really important to them. They want to master their skills. So a young man or woman who joins to fly airplanes, to fix airplanes, ships, submarines, they want to see a progression of their skill set that become, allows them to become masters at what they do. And the, and the last one is purpose. You know, what's, do I have a purpose when I wake up every morning? Well, I'm not sure that there's a better business or company in the world that you can have a greater purpose in serving your country. So if we can give them that autonomy, mastery, and purpose, they're going to stay. And we're going to attract the right folks. That said, they're not going to stay in a 19th century uh, personnel system, which is what we've had for way too long. Uh, I use the the uh, Lucille Ball chocolate factory analogy because it works. That's been our process. Lots of chocolates coming off and some get eaten, some get stuffed, and some make it to market. That's, it's completely inefficient 
and it doesn't keep the right people. So we've we set course, uh, and CMP Admiral Bob Burke has done a magnificent job of pulling this system forward to modernize the information technology, to get information to sailors. They have greater choice, greater flexibility, and they've got greater awareness of what's available to them. When we, when we deliver on that, which is going to be within the next year to two years, I think sailors will go, finally, I can get online with my PDA and I can figure out what's next. I can understand what's going to happen to me, my family, in the future, and I can plan. Uh, that's going to be really, really important to the future of our ability to attract and retain the right people. Um, from a, uh, uh, let me take it now to hardware because I know our time is short and you're going to get the hook here in a minute. Yeah. Uh, from a shipbuilding perspective, um, 355 ships uh, is the plan. Um, but there are all sorts of challenges. Congress still has questions as it's always had about a 30 year shipbuilding plan that still falls short in sort of figuring out exactly how you get to that, uh, that bigger fleet. Um, if you were going to choose what in the fleet and where in the fleet the resources get spent, especially if defense spending does not keep surging the way it does. Have you guys thought through where are you going to put that extra incremental dollar if you can't put it in the plan as it currently exists? Yeah, we. Th this is something we work day to day on in the, in the budget environment. Uh, we all know we got a nice injection of, of money in 17 to go after readiness issues. We applied that money against readiness issues. 18 was to, to fill in the holes of readiness or make our fleet more whole. Uh, and we've put those resources against that wholeness. 19 and out was the growth opportunity. So if you took care of what you had and made it whole, you automatically increase the size of the usable fleet from what you already, what exists in the fleet today. Uh, to, to go to a higher level, that target of 355, which is now the law, um, is, a, is a target that we're going after. How quickly you get there depends on the resource that comes with it and how effective we are at finding money within our own business processes. And there's money to be had there. We're going after that. Secretary Gertz spoke eloquently about how to get after the resources from within our own accounts to help pay for that growth. Uh, but, w you know, I always think of the budget as a rubber band. That's the amount of money you get, and there's three posts that you got to wrap that rubber band around. You know, one's how you operate the fleet, one's how you modernize the fleet, and then one's how you man the fleet. And if any one of those posts move out, that stretches that rubber band. It gets thinner and thinner and less elastic. On the other hand, if the rubber band the next year is smaller, one of those posts has to move in to be able to fit it around it. And, and that's, that's the challenge we go through every year in this cycle. And so your question is being asked every time we debate whether we throw more money at readiness and operating that force, or whether we bring in more people to build the force we need to have, or whether we modernize it, whether it's new construction or new capabilities. Um, let me ask you an LCS question. We were out in San Diego. Uh, we were lucky enough to be there twice in a couple of months. Uh, went out to the waterfront, uh, was aboard uh, USS Omaha, uh, and that video uh, is, is up on our site now. Um, the newest of the LCS ships, there are a dozen of them now uh, that have been more than that now commissioned. Um, but there is a view that they're not out doing very much right now. You know, the Navy keeps talking about what the future program is, which is the frigate, the FFGX, but not as much as what the LCS is out there doing right now. Talk to us a little bit about what the LCS is doing right now, whether we're still, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who was like, look, we're still in the learning phase on it. But the critics of the program say, look, I mean, we've been in the learning phase on this program for a long time. What are they actually operationally doing? Talk to us a little bit about the operational utility of these ships and what they're doing now. Yeah, I mean, we, we have been doing a lot with these ships for some time, mainly in improving their operational availability, the, the physical plant, the ability to take the ship to sea and operate it. What's lagged behind over the program period it has been the mission packages that go on it. They allow it to do ASW, ASUW, and countermine. Those packages are still in the, some, some are a little further along than others, but until we fill them out, get the crews trained up on them, uh, it, it's going it's to depend on, on those mission packages getting delivered to the fleet. So uh, I'm encouraged by that. It's a program that, you, again, it's a, it's a program that was designed to be able to update and modernize in kits. And so those kits continue to be developed and 
to your point, it's taken a long time and the world has changed. So now we're looking at kits that make that, that could make LCS more effective down the road uh, if we can develop them. Um, you uh, were a submarine hunter and a very good one, uh, deemed from your exchange with the German right. Navy so. chief. <laughs> German Navy chief, uh, just a little well, your same year group. Uh, he's 82, you're, you're 81. Uh, he was a Cold War submarine, or you were a Cold War uh, submarine killer. Um, those skills atrophied for a long time. Mm -hmm. We were using the P3s very, very differently. Um, you guys uh, prided yourself on passive detection. Uh, you would go active only in a very limited number of cases. Generally, your effort, either you were hurting somebody, but generally you wanted to be sure to listen, to not compromise anybody who may also have been in proximity mm -hmm. uh, as well because when you go active, everything in the water column is il illuminated. Some of our allies, but even some of the folks in the Navy have been questioning this sort of all active mindset that's seen as sort of a quick way of, of building what is a very delicate, difficult skill at a time when the adversary submarines are also getting much, much quieter and harder, harder to find, but that presents a challenge. How long do you think it's going to take to get really where we want to be in terms of the, the Navy's ASW capabilities uh, is the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, you know, is the active measure the right way to do that? Um, given again, some of some of the folks in our own Navy, but as well as some of our allied navies are like, wow, guys, you know, if you're going to drive around actively pinging all the time, that's that's a existential scenario for us. Mm -hmm. There's a role for passive and there's a role for active. Uh, we've got a really nice balance of those capabilities right now in the fleet on the, on the air ASW side, both helicopter and P-8, P-3. feel very comfortable on the roadmap we're on. What's going to make that roadmap even better is the use of artificial intelligence. I hate to keep using that word as if it's a panacea, but it's real. And if you can, if you can uh, analyze data, large amounts of data, machine to machine, that and then be able to derive decision-making tools or decisions from that information, that's going to speed us up and make us more effective. Uh, so we're actively, no pun intended, actively going after the AI to help us understand how to, how to take full advantage of the passive energy that's in the water. Um, on the active side, we've been, we've been pioneers in active for a long time. I feel very comfortable with where we are with active capabilities. Now, on the surface side, it is, um, it, it's always a challenge on a ship uh, to have that reliability, but the improvements in our tails and improvements in our sonar over the last 10, 15 years is, is going to make the team approach to ASW, and it is a team game, uh, very effective. We are the best in the world at anti-submarine warfare through undersea capabilities, our own submarines, our ships, and our aviation units. Nobody else has this capability. Uh, and we're moving, this is one area I'm pretty confident, we're moving faster than our adversary. Let me ask you one brief AI question before you get the hook. Um, China is investing a vast quantity of money in artificial intelligence, something like 20% of the state budget or R&D budget, which is a large amount of money. Um, even, you know, we, we think we're spending a lot, they're spending a lot more money on it. Doesn't automatically mean that somebody is gonna build a better mousetrap, but it does give them a little bit of a drop on it. Hey, it's worked for us. Uh, we've used brains and, and money to get to where we are. Do you have any concern and what's the Navy doing? And what are you doing in terms of your own thinking? Because I know you think about this issue. How does the Chinese ability to leverage AI that may actually be better than ours change the game in their favor and how they might be able to use it, just like you're trying to use it uh, for, for you know, the purposes of your force? Well, if, you, if we make an assumption that they have access to the data that we have, uh, and they're ahead of us in AI, that's, that should be of concern because that means they're gonna be able to turn faster on that data. Um, I don't know if they have access to the same data, but they certainly don't have the same capabilities as we have. Uh, but we, ought to, we are watching very closely uh, what AI developments are taking place around the world, and there's a lot of energy being spent both in DOD, but especially outside DOD, where we're trying to partner with our industrial base uh, and our academic institutions on how to better utilize AI for the purpose of uh, assessing and analyzing our own data f for faster, better purposes.
You were 1981 uh, from the United States Naval Academy. There's a big game always uh, at the end of the year. Mark Esper, the Secretary of the Army who went to West Point, is very confident that Army is going to uh, go for three uh, here in a row, breaking obviously the long Navy streak. Uh, how do you feel? Uh, what's your sense? I know it's still early, but what's your sense for the end of the year? Where are you placing your bet? You know where I'm coming down on this. So just, just to be provocative, there's confidence and then there's competence. And I think our competence is going to win. And there you have it. Admiral right. Bill Moran, 39th Vice Chief of Naval Operations, sir. Thanks so much. Thanks, Fargo. Good to see you.